my colleague, Dr. Sally Southern and Goldman, and I uh, have just completed our little 1,522-page <laughs> pamphlet on the Kanda, the seventh and final book of the legendary poet Sir Valmiki's monumental epic. This will mark the conclusion of our consortial four-decade, seven-volume, 5,522-page 5, translation project, the journey which might justify the title of the talk and why I'm seeing this thing on the um, But with thanks and homage to those, those who have participated in this uh, project, the living and the departed, I would like to talk today about another extraordinary, if less metaphorical, journey undertaken by one of world literature's grandest villains, the magnificent but monstrous demon king Ravana, scourge of gods and sages, and the arch enemy of the epic's divine hero, Rama. Before doing so, let me say a few words about the specific textual source for the journey we will be discussing. It might work out. Oh. Um, modern. Whoa. Oh, something happened. That's encouraging. <laughs> uh, Rama is helping somebody. Um, Rama's great poem has been revered for millennia by Hindus as a holy and salvific. Uh, Um, the earthly career, it's an account of the earthly career of the divinity Vishnu. Vishnu in the guise of a warrior prince, <coughs> Rama, as a template for normative social and political conduct and the world's first example, as the poem is regarded, of the poetic art. For those of you not very familiar with the work, its seventh book, called simply The Final Chapter, the Uttarakhanda, has had a complex and controversial receptive history among its intended audiences, poets, and theologians writing on the Rama theme, and among modern scholars and lay audiences alike down to the present day. Many pre-modern and modern versions of the epic tale modify or completely eliminate its more controversial episodes or not infrequently excise the book entirely. One devoted and knowledgeable reader of the poem with whom I've been in fitful correspondence for some years has referred to it in print as the pretender kanda. Modern scholarship has not generally been kind to the book, regarding it as a late, crude, and digressive epilogue to the epic's more authentic kandas, two through six, as, uh, as uh, Luis referred to it, definitely it is later in some ways. Uh, indeed, as a sketchy account of the epic hero's latter years, interspersed with a ragged collection of unrelated Puranic narratives. In fact, in the course of our research, we've come to think of the Uttarakhanda as something of the Rodney Dangerfield of Sanskrit epic studies. <laughs> <laughs> Among significant elements of the poem's devotees, admirers, and scholarly critics, it, like Mr. Dangerfield, don't get no respect. <laughs> there are good reasons, narrative, linguistic, theological, aesthetic, and social, for the ambivalent response to the book over its long history, reasons the explication of which would require far more time than we have available today. Those interested will find them discussed in great detail in the introduction and annotation to the newly released volume. But I would like to turn to an even less studied and, if possible, less highly regarded body of texts that are found in some, mainly northern manuscripts of the poem. These are commented upon by only one of the work's many medieval and early modern commentators and are rendered in only a few of its translations. They are the so-called prakshipta, or interpolated passages, that, when they are present in the manuscript traditions at all, are found in sections at several points in the Uttarakhanda's narrative that are set off from the rest, as the prakshipta episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. In the critical edition that forms the central focus of our work, they are uh, excised completely from the critical uh, text and relegated to the uh, uh, copious appendices. 
So if you follow my crude metaphor of the Uttarakhandas being the Rodney Dangerfield of the Ramayana, then you could go further with me and think of the Prakshipta passages of the Uttarakhandas' own Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> These passages are grouped into three sections of varying length, each section dealing with a different topic. One of these contains the sage Augustus' rather peculiar tale of the transgendered monkey lord Riksha Rajas, who in a rather bizarre fashion becomes both the mother and father of the rival simian brothers Valen and Sugriva. I'll, I'll spare you the details you wouldn't want to hear. Another <laughs> section shows Rama, the epic's hero, as king and chief magistrate during his legendary millennia-long reign, dispensing judgments in rather unusual judicial proceedings. One, a case of assault brought by a talking dog against a Brahmin, and the other, a property dispute between an owl and a vulture. But these curious episodes, interesting though they are, should, need not detain us today. By far the longest section of the Uttarakhanda concerns itself with neither the hero of the poem nor with its famous simian allies. Instead, it focuses on his nemesis, the monstrous world conqueror, and serial sexual predator, Ravana. Indeed, the villain's genealogy and account of his campaign of rape, abduction, and world domination occupies the entire first half of the book. While in its remainder, Rama serves mainly as the auditor or narrator of a series of exemplary and or cautionary tales, including that of Ravana, that illustrate the duties and perils of kingship. The only two episodes in the book where Rama takes direct and forceful action on his own are the most controversial moments in the epic and are among the most principal reasons for the dis distaste the book has aroused on the part of a variety of audiences over the long course of its history. These are the cruel banishment of his pregnant wife Sita and his summary execution of the Shudra ascetic Shambhuka. But I'm not going to be talking about those either today. <laughs> Instead, let me turn to the Prakshipta passages that provide an addendum to Ravana's dark anti-Heldenleben, you might call it, and take the form of a strange travelogue of his adventures and the reason behind their late inclusion in the larger textual corpus of the epic. Five chapters of the first Prakshipta section are interpolated into the narrative near the midpoint of the account of Ravana's career. To contextualize the passage, we should understand that in that chapter, after having penetrated to the underworld and his fabulous flying palace, Ravana has freed the damned from their hellish torments and fought the god of death himself to a draw. The Rakshasa king then conquers the Asura city of Ashmanagara, stoner town, I guess you could call it, and goes on to assault the undersea realm of Varuna, the Indian Neptune. After defeating that god's warriors and finding to his disappointment that the deity himself is out of town for a concert, the Rakshasa heads for home stopping once again in Ashmanagara, and it's here that the interpolated passage begins. Wandering about the city, let's see if this is going to work for me now. Yay. Wandering about the city, Rama comes upon a splendid mansion. He tries to enter it, but he finds the doorway blocked by a magnificent and terrifying person, the sight of whom gives the normally fearless king pause. The mysterious figure then offers Ravana the choice of fighting either him or the legendary demon king Bali. Evading Ravana's questions as to who he is, the figure launches into a paean of praise for Bali. Ravana presses on into the mansion where he finds the mighty Bali, who having taken on a cosmic form, is awaiting him. And here you see the uh, figure guarding the gateway and so on. Here's Ravana in his palace, and he's the gateway to this remarkable palace. Um, he picks the fearsome Ravana up, Bali does, as one might a small child, and placing him astride his hip as an Indian mother might carry her infant, tells him that the man at the doorway was none other than the supreme lord of the universe, Vishnu Narayana, whose nature and deeds he extols at great length. This uncanny encounter with the primordial lord sets the stage for a remarkable narrative of Ravana's travels that will take him over the seas and into outer space, in search of worthy opponents and ultimately bring him face to face in confrontation with the supreme deity. This will thus bring the monstrous and rapacious demon under the spell of the emerging theological movement of Hindu devotionalism, which will become the dominant thread in the complex fabric of Hindu belief and praxis from the time of the epics to the present day. Ravana now launches his great flying palace into deep space. Here he is. Uh, uh, 
to challenge the dazzling sun god Surya himself, either to offer him battle or declare himself vanquished. The blazing divinity, recognizing that discretion is the greater part of valor, authorizes his gatekeeper to make a decision for him. The gatekeeper prudently selects the latter option so that Ravana is able to proclaim another triumph without having to battle. Having subdued the sun, Ravana next decides to conquer the moon god. On his travels through the upper atmosphere, he encounters heroes who were slain in battle, philanthropists, sages, mounted in splendid conveyances on the way to the heavenly realms that they have earned by their virtuous deeds. Frustrated that none of these are willing to fight with him, Ravana is directed to the great king Mandhata, who, having conquered the seven continents himself, appears to be taking a victory lap through the heavens. Rama challenges the human king, and the two engage in a tremendous hair-raising aerial dogfight. And here you see it. There's uh, Ravana in his uh, chariot, his Mandata in his uh, chariot, and the two forces are fighting it out. Uh, Rav, uh, each of them prepares to dis deploy a particularly powerful WMD, Ravana taking up that of Shiva, the destroyer of the world, and Mandata, that of Brahma, the creator. The gods themselves quake in terror until a pair of sages intervene and stop the violence. The two kings then part in delight as fast friends. Ravana now resumes his ascent into outer space. And here he is in his flying chariot, in his flying chariot uh, attempting to assault the moon. He climbs by stages of 10,000 leagues through each of the eight paths of the wind as they are understood in the Puranic cosmology. He thus rises sequentially through the realms of the great hamsas, the three types of clouds, the perfected beings, um, <coughs> celestial bards who you see floating around here and there, the malignant spirits, the atmospheric river Ganga is up there, uh, the mighty bird lord Garuda who's flying around here somewhere. Um, and last, the heavenly Ganges. Finally, at an elevation of 80,000 leagues, he reaches the realm where the moon, accompanied by the planets and the constellations, abides. The moon, glaring at Ravana and his forces, burns them with his cold fire, such that his ministers, suffering from frostbite, withdraw and beg their master to follow him. But Ravana strikes the moon with his arrows, injuring it. However, before things get out of hand, Ravana's great-grandfather, the creator divinity Brahma comes in haste to persuade him to desist, buying him off, as it were, with a powerful Shaivite mantra said to grant its possessor long life and the ability to crush his enemies. After a short stay at home, Ravana decides to make another journey of conquest, this time overseas. He and his warrior ministers travel to an island in the western ocean. There he spies an extraordinary figure, a brief, a brief portion of whose description may give you an idea of the rhetoric involved. He appeared to have a terrifying form, like a veritable fire risen at the end of the cosmic era. He was like the lord of gods among the gods, like the sun among heavenly bodies. He was like a lion among shudabas, which are mythical beasts, like a ravana among elephants, like Mount Meru among mountains, and like the parijata among trees. His glance was flickering wildly like the circle of planets. The sound of his grinding teeth was like that of a machine being torn to shreds. He had fangs. He was monstrous. His neck was like a conch shell. He had a mighty chest. His belly was like a frog's. His jaws were like a lion's. He resembled the peak of Mount Kailasa. He was fearsome. The soles of his feet were lotuses, and the lotus-like hands had red palms, and so on and so forth. Ravana is not someone to be so easily intimidated. So he sees that person and says, please give me battle. But that person who was as unshakable as is a lion by a leopard, an elephant by a sharaba, and so on and so forth, says to him, I shall destroy your faith in battle, you evil-minded Rakshasa. He is on the island. Whatever striking force that Ravana possessed, a thousand times that force was resident in that man. So that struck, merely brushed, as if in play, Ravana was crushed to the ground. Nothing daunted, he gets up and pursues this person into a cave. And you see the opening of the, oops, again, the opening of the cave here, where he sees an astonishing sight. Upon passing through that all opening, Ravana, fearless on account of his boon, remember he had a boon that no one 
no superior being could harm him. He saw men who were like heaps of black collyrium, wearing armlets. They were adorned with rings, diamonds, and so on. He saw 30 million of these great beings dancing. They were constantly festive, free from anxiety, spotless, and they resembled fire. He watched those 30 million fearless men who looked in every way just like the man he had seen. The Rakshasa watched these immensely powerful beings who all shared the same complexion, the same strength, the same appearance. These it will turn out to be our Vaishnava devotees. This is where they get to. Ravana withdraws, but now spl spies a splendid white mansion, right? Uh, and inside he sees an indescribably beautiful woman, the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi herself. Uh, fanning a man lying on a bed. And you can see this is obviously uh, Vishnu, with the standard scene of Lakshmi massaging his feet. Reverting to his form as a serial sexual predator, he tries to seize this woman. This awakens the man who pushes aside the bed curtains and laughs at the demon's temerity with a force that sends him sprawling unconscious to the ground. He tells the Rakshasa that it is only the boon of Brahma that prevents him from killing him on the spot, but promises that he will do so in good time. So this is the prediction of the Rama Avatar. Stirred but not shaken, Rama falls back on the power of his boon, claiming that no one can compass his death, and noting that even should this being prove to be an exception, then death at his hands would prove most glorious. Ravana then saw within the body of the god the entire triple world with its fixed and moving contents. For within the limbs of him who lay on that bed were visible in their subtle forms, the Adityas, the Maruts, the Sadhyas, the Vasus, the Ashvans, the Rudras, the ancestors, Yama, Kubera, Vaishravana, the oceans, the mountains, the rivers, the Vedas, knowledge, the three sacred fires, the planets. So in other words, you get a kind of reprise of the Gita's famous Vishvarupa, Vairata Rupa, uh, of Lord Krishna. You will easily recognize that description, obviously. Um, now, this revelation of the true nature of the God is important for what follows in the Prakshipta passages travelogue of Ravana's amazing journey. For next, we have an account of the demon king's conversation with the holy sage Sum uh, Sanat Kumara, one of the mind-born sons of Brahma. Ravana asks him, who is the greatest being in the world and most powerful among the gods? Um, upon learning that it is Vishnu, who is worshipped by all the gods and seers, he asks two further questions. He wants to know what becomes of demons who are slain in battle by the gods, and what about those slain by Lord Vishnu himself? The former, he is told, always attain the heavenly realm, but eventually fall from there to be born on earth in accordance with their good or evil karma. The latter, however, those killed by Vishnu, attain the imperishable abode of the Lord, even whose wrath is like a boon. So you can see now this early development of this so-called Divesha Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Upon hearing this, Ravana is delighted and ponders how might he meet Lord Vishnu in battle. He now directs himself to the vast continent of, uh, well, I don't have a picture of it, of Shveta Dvipa in the Western Ocean, where dwells a mighty race of giants whose arms are like iron bars. This is the abode of those for whom Narayana is the highest refuge and who worship him with single-minded devotion. Hearing this, Ravana resolves to travel to Shveta Deepa, a place difficult for even the gods to reach, and give battle to the Lord himself. Approaching this terrifying continent, he is deserted by his retainers, forced to send back his flying palace, as he is unable to progress against the region's fierce headwinds. Landing, Ravana takes on a fearsome form and is spotted, and this is kind of amusing, by a group of women. When he tells them he has come for battle, they laugh at him. Then one of them, enraged, easily lifted him as if he were a child. And then, having seized the ten-faced Ravana by the waist, she whirled him around in the midst of her friends. Calling to another friend, she said, Look at the disgusting insect I have caught. It has ten heads and twenty arms. And it looks like black collyrium. She was he was tossed from hand to hand by these women until he became dizzy and nauseated. <laughs> then, as the powerful and wise Rakshasa was being whirled about, he bit one of those women on the hand. She dropped that repulsive insect, shaking him off. 
but another seized him and flew up through the uh, sky. Then in a towering rage, he raked her with his nails. Shaken off, that Rakshasa, overcome with terror, fell into the waters of the ocean like a mountain peak torn off by a thunderbolt. He fell into the water, and thus was Ravana seized and whirled about there by the young women who lived in Shveta Deepa. So it's like the island of the Amazons, right? So here the great lord of the three worlds, as he uh, considers himself, is reduced to a pitiful plaything by a group of superwomen who toss him aside like some bug. So this uh, Prashipta passage discussing lend a distinct teleology to the history of Ravana and then to the entire Ramavatara itself, re-envisioning the demon king as one of the great bhaktas or devotees of the Lord and placing him squarely in this strange circle of the beneficiaries of Dvesha Bhakti, the humans and demons whose enmity for God will lead them intentionally or inadvertently to salvation. Indeed, by the time of the medieval versions of the Ramayana and the massively influential work such as the Ram Charitmanas, the major goal of virtually all demonic forces is to get themselves killed by Rama as quickly as possible, for that is the fastest path to liberation. This passage also contributes to a growing consensus on the part of Vaishnava commentators and theologians that ties Ravana to a transmigrational history of slow but steady progress toward union with the Lord. According to this tradition, the Rakshasa Lord is a reincarnation of earlier demonic foes of God and Dharma, whose careers are detailed in the Puranas. Thus, in a previous existence, he was the mighty Asura Hiranyaksha, who for his attempt to carry off the earth and the Vedas was slain by Vishnu in the form of Varaha, or the boar invitation, incarnation, only to be reborn, as in the picture, as the demon lord Hiranyakashipu, a virulent foe of Vishnu who was torn apart by the claws of the lord's man-lion, Narasimha Avatara. It's Hiranyakashipu who, we understand, is reborn as Ravana, but the aeon's long quest for purification and salvation at the violent hand of God does not quite end with Ravana's death at Ravana's hands in the great battle before the walls of Lanka. The Vaishnava tradition holds that he has yet one more life of intense misotheism, if you like. It's a nice word. Look it up. Before his train of angry incarnations can come to an end. For in his history, Ravana is not quite liberated through having been slain by Rama. Instead, he must be born again in the... Vapara Yuga, as the notorious <laughs> foe and rival of Krishna, Shishupala, the Chedya king, who gets beheaded by the Lord in the assembly of the Kauravas, as described in the Sapaparvan of the Mahabharata. But as the headless king falls, according to the Mahabharata, his splendid, blazing, vital energy, Agriyam Tejaha, is seen to leave his body and, after paying homage to the Lord, to enter the body of Krishna thus bringing to an end the long series of deaths at the hands of God. So it is only after this extraordinary journey that the mighty but now thoroughly humiliated Ravana comes to understand that in order to progress toward his ultimate goal, salvation and union with God, he must provoke the Supreme Lord of the universe to kill him in battle, but that Lord Vishnu, constrained by the boon of Brahma, cannot do so in his divine form. And this, therefore, is why the great Rakshasa abducted, but in no way molested, Sita, the wife of Rama, and the goddess Lakshmi incarnate, not because of any improper desire for her. And so Ravana's long, strange trip, as rendered in the Prachipta Sargas of the Valmiki Ramayana, reveals itself as one of the earlier sustained narratives of the virtually unique Hindu concept of Dvesha Bhakti, religious devotion through enmity, a belief that holds that powerful and single-minded emotional concentration on Godhead, even when driven by hatred, can lead one to salvation and union with the Lord. This then becomes part of a thoroughgoing devotional revision of the epic as manifested in the exegesis of the poems at the hands of its sectarian commentators, <clears throat> some of whom read the text as containing two distinct levels of meaning, the surface or apparent spashtarta level of the tale of the ultimate battle of good and evil and a deeper ultimate vastava level of devotion. It is the same impetus and understanding that drives the powerful devotional fervor of the influential medieval and early modern renderings of the Rama story, such as the Adhyatma and Ananda Ramayanas and the Ram Charitmanas that has informed the understanding of the Ram Katha for hundreds of millions of Hindus down to the present day. Thank you. Thank you.